All right, hello, and welcome to everyone joining us in the room and via the live stream online. For all of you, I encourage you to continue the conversation online using the hashtag pound open internet, all one word. Um, I'm Sarah Morris, Senior Policy Counsel for the Open Technology Institute at New America Foundation. And I'm thrilled to introduce a really great group of participants here today to talk about the future of our communications ecosystem. We're here today to talk about the open internet, to hear about the status of the case in the DC circuit where the FCC's open internet order is being challenged. But we're also here to look more broadly at the problems that have emerged as the FCC grapples with the scope of its authority over modern communications networks. The challenges that result affect us all and will continue to affect us all. Arbitrary regulatory distinctions mean that federal policies are leaving important fundamental principles behind in the internet era. Principles that, en that ensure our communications network connect everyone, everywhere. That our networks serve as open platforms that allow each of us to access the content of our choosing and to communicate unencumbered. That new competitors can actually compete on a level playing field with incumbent providers. And ultimately, that a digital divide marked by racial, socioeconomic, or geographic lines is not perpetuated. The values that underlie these principles, the benchmarks of what is known as common carriage, date back over a century. They aren't new. And the FCC needn't reinvent the rules, reinvent the wheel. So we'll discuss here what a modernized application of these principles might look like in the context of 21st century communications. And joining me in the discussion today, are Matt Wood, Policy Director at Free Press, Stephen Renderos, National o Organizer for the Center for Media Justice, Marty Donaghy, Donaghy, did I say it right? <laughs> uh, from AARP, um, Angie Cronenberg from Comtel, and Susan Crawford, Professor at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, Fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, Co-Director at the Berkman Center, former Special Assistant for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy to President Barack Obama, and author of Captive Audience, The Telecom Industry and Monopoly Power in the Gilded Age. Susan, we're so pleased to have you here, and I know you have much to say on this topic, so I'll turn the floor over to you for opening remarks, after which we'll proceed to a conversation among all the participants. Well, thank you, Sarah, and welcome to everybody, and thanks particularly to the New America Foundation for hosting us. So there's a spray of issues in communications policy and law and a lot of shiny objects and a lot of confusion. So it must be a relief to especially the journalists in the crowd here that the case being argued on Monday at the DC Circuit, it's called Verizon versus FCC, actually presents a, a moment of grandeur, a very significant historical moment. The question presented by the case is, does the U.S. government have any role to play when it comes to ensuring ubiquitous, open, world-class, interconnected, reasonably priced internet access? Does the government have good reasons to ensure that facility in America? I believe it does, both for competitiveness reasons, because in Asia in particular, uh, countries are adopting industrial policies pushing towards exactly that end. And also because we have an obligation to ensure a thriving middle class that can help this country remain, remain strong for generations. So this case being argued on Monday that we'll discuss today is situated in history for two powerful reasons. It is an attack on the idea that the government has any role in ensuring open, world-class, ubiquitous, interconnected, reasonably priced, high-speed internet access. And it's a, an attack on that idea both at the administrative level, so whether FCC has delegated authority from Congress to do what it did in the open internet rule that we'll discuss. And administratively, that attack is very strong. And it stems from some elaborate legal gymnastics that many people in this room are ver very highly qualified to talk about. And they'll talk about it in detail if you want. But that's all about policy. Those decisions made by the FCC were made against the background of assumed legal authority. And we'll get through those policy decisions one way or another. 
They'll get decided. That's the administrative level. What I'd like to highlight this afternoon is the profound, the profound attack this case represents on congressional authority to say anything about high-speed internet access under the Commerce Clause. Each talk has just one message, and so I get one thing that you will remember today. And that one thing that's so important is that the D.C. Circuit must firmly squash Verizon's First Amendment claim that any oversight of its high-speed internet access service would be unconstitutional. The D.C. Circuit must stop this argument in its tracks. Verizon says that in its capacity, when it's wearing that hat as a high-speed internet access provider, it is the same as the Washington Post. And that any effort by government to constrain its ability to slice and dice and prioritize and make deals with content providers about that high-speed inter internet access could be found, should be found, unconstitutional under the First Amendment. Now, Verizon has plenty of good reasons to make this astonishing and laughable argument. It's an attempt to constitutionalize the regulation of general purpose communications networks. They want to move questions about the oversight of those networks out of the political realm, out of the political branch, congressional delegated power to the FCC, over to the courts. And make sure that there's a roadblock, a very tall constitutional roadblock to any oversight. They seek to re remove any threat any threat of oversight over high-speed internet access. We've seen this before. In the Lochner era, exactly the same claims were made by companies seeking to remove regulatory oversight. But even then, telephone companies did not have the chutzpah to claim that the First Amendment would bar any oversight or regulation of their transport activities. Verizon's goal here is to make this sound like a serious legitimate constitutional argument. If they get there, that's a win. If it sounds serious, it's a win for them. Because that will make some court, and they're hoping it's the Supreme Court, someday, and they'll make this argument over and over and over again, agree that this is a serious question. That oversight of high-speed internet access or any general purpose transport network raises constitutional questions about speech, and then they'll pivot and they'll say, well, in light of these very serious questions, you can't possibly defer to what the administrative agency, in this case, the FCC, has done to exert oversight over us. They will repeat this over and over again, this laughable argument. This happened with healthcare. Just keep saying it and hope that someone believes you that there's a constitutional claim at issue here. Well, I'm here to tell you that the government has very good reasons to oversee the operation of these general purpose transport networks. And these reasons are so good, and Verizon's claim is so absurd, uh, that it's important that the DC Circuit make a plain statement about this. Now remember why we have a First Amendment. It's to keep government from directing the content of messages, from favoring certain points of view. What is the likelihood that government in the net neutrality order at issue in this particular case or any other arena of communications policy over general purpose transport networks is actually suppressing speech or attempting to favor certain messages over others. I'll tell you what that likelihood is. It's zero. That's not what's going on here. There is no subterfuge, no attempt to censor. Verizon will say it's being forced to subsidize speech by being obliged to be neutral. That's nonsense. Fifty years ago, those same arguments were made by segregationists, saying that their lunch counters were being used to subsidize sit-ins. Those arguments only rated a paragraph fifty years ago. They were disgraceful at the time. Here, sure, everything subsidizes something else, but there has to be some line. Scalia said this clearly about 10 years ago, that it, a curbstone philosopher would claim that everything is related to everything else. But there's a line, and a transport network is not subsidizing the speech that travels over it. 
certainly not subsidizing messages, understandable messages by an audience with which it does not agree. That's not going on in this, in this case. The DC Circuit needs to slam the door on this First Amendment argument decisively. Because what Verizon is really trying to do in this entire case is protect its profitable position. It wants power to squeeze profit everywhere, both at its interconnection points with other networks and in the last mile by prioritizing and discriminating with respect to traffic. But economic loss is not a First Amendment injury. Verizon is free to speak anytime it wants to about anything. Merely allowing other people's speech to cross its lines does not amount to compelled speech. Luckily, in a recent Supreme Court decision, Justice Roberts very methodically made that clear in the context of the Solomon Amendment case. So we're hoping that the DC Circuit pays attention to that. And Verizon is not being singled out. These companies who are at issue in the open net order are regulated entities who provide wires and transmission lines and uh, use rights of way to provide uh, general purpose communications into US households. Yes, uh, we're, uh, there's a line between regulated entities and applications that use the internet. That's a line. It doesn't mean that the regulated entities are being singled out as speakers for their messages. The sidewalk is different from the conversation. And right now, we're worried about the sidewalk's unconstrained power to rise up and make more money by picking and choosing the particular conversations of which it approves. Importantly, government has plenty of good reasons to prefer open networks to private carriage, to ensure ubiquitous access, just as our phone system was the envy of the world when it was built, and to make sure our infrastructure is world class. Indeed, the First Amendment and its protect its protection of dissent and uh, freedom of the press is demeaned by Verizon's argument in this case. We're an ahistorical country, but surely we have not forgotten where all this came from, and we have common sense. Verizon is not a newspaper being forced to support views it opposes. It's trying to use the Miami Herald case to say that's who it is. Nor is it wearing this hat a television distributor exercising editorial discretion over which stations or programs to include in its repertoire. That's another case it's trying to use, the Turner case from 1994. Now left to its own devices, Verizon providing high-speed internet access would like to cableize internet access, would like to choose programs and channels. So this claim has a crucial timing element to it. And a chicken and egg aspect here, it's gotta be squelched before it becomes true all on its own. Studies have shown that the benefits of open transport communications networks to all of society far exceed the short-term benefits to carriers of extracting deals that help their stock price. This is not about regulating the internet, this is about regulating internet access and the congressional authority to do so. So to sum up, the DC Circuit has to make this clear, or we risk giving up on oversight over a basic network input into absolutely everything we do. We need to reclaim the regulatory ideal which unleashes human capital that is now stunted in this country. This won't be disruptive to those of us who are on the top, who have fine educations. It will be true though that failing to do so risks wreaking havoc. We have a shared purpose as a nation. We empower the wrongly disenfranchised. It's in our collective self-interest to get this right. And this appellate case is part of the fabric of this story. Verizon versus FCC is the right case in which the DC Circuit can make clear that Verizon is not a First Amendment actor when it is transporting internet access. Because Verizon is so clearly wrong in making that argument. And I look forward to the DC Circuit explaining why Verizon is wrong, slowly, clearly, and methodically. And I hope the argument on Monday is illuminating in that regard. Thank you for giving me the honor of listening to me, and I look forward to hearing from everybody else in this panel. Thanks. Thank you, Susan, for that compelling examination of a core issue in the Open Internet Order Challenge. Um, I'd like to turn now to you, Matt, um, and uh, let you give us a bit more context and background on the, the case, where we are, how we got there. 
Um, and then we'll turn to the other panelists for, um, to give them the opportunity to explain what, what all of this means for them and for their constituencies. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here, as always. Uh, Susan's done her usual brilliant job framing this case and telling you what net neutrality is not. It is not content regulation. It's not speech regulation. It's simply regulation of a communications network. And I love that line about the confusing the sidewalk for the conversation. I mean, we've had a regulated phone network for a while, and in some ways still do. But that doesn't mean the government or anybody is regulating what you and I say to each other on that phone. It means that there is a basic guarantee of openness and access and universal service and affordability for that line that connects us all. So that's what net neutrality isn't. It isn't some sort of content regulation. It isn't regulating the internet, even though people will try that tired line on you even today. Uh, what it is is a simple statement that of these centuries-old principles that the person you pay to ship something for you can't mess with the contents of what they're carrying for you. Simply saying that contrary to Verizon's claim, ISPs can't edit the internet. They can't edit your email messages. They can't tell you which websites you can go to and which ones you can't go to. They can't say you can use some applications and services but not others. As long as those applications and services aren't somehow harmful to their network, you should be able to use any one of them. They can't say some sites will cost you more and some services will cost you more, especially those, coincidentally, that compete with our own services. So a company like Comcast might say, you know, we really like it when you pay us twice. We like it when you pay us for cable TV service and we like it when you also pay us for internet access. Wouldn't it be nice if we could keep you from relying on the internet access piece for all of your video and keep that second check coming to us every month for TV services. This isn't hypothetical, this isn't abstract, this is something that they have tried to do, and that's really the genesis of the open internet case we have today. There was a predecessor case in the DC circuit that basically ran from 2007 through 2010 and finished up just as this one was kicking off at the FCC. So it's not hypothetical, it's something that I promise you ISPs want to do today. You hear them talking about it at panels and conferences like this one, slightly fancier perhaps, uh, in places like Aspen where they say, we should be allowed to quote, experiment with new schemes for paying for content. And what they mean by that is more money flowing into the ISP's coffers, not only from the people who pay them to deliver content to them. I, you know, I pay Comcast, which is a shame to say, uh, for that internet connection. And they want to have the ability to charge also Google or Facebook or Netflix or whomever, more importantly, the smaller companies that aren't quite as well healed as those guys are today. They want to have the ability to charge them as well for getting that content to me and creating all these additional revenue streams. And as Susan said, monetizing the network in all those sorts of ways. So how does that get us to today? What do these open internet rules that are under challenge in the court this week actually do? How well do they live up to that principle of what I just said they should do, which is basically keep the ISP the conduit itself from interfering with the message it's carrying for you. They do a, a decent job, I guess you'd have to say. I mean, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, there have been no complaints. There have been no high-profile adjudications at the FCC, so obviously that means there's no need for the rules, right? I think it just shows that the rules have in some way worked. They've basically kept the lid on some of these worst ISP gatekeeping abuses, and they have worked to constrain some of their behaviors, even though, again, you hear them sort of talking about it, saying, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this? They haven't constrained every bit of bad behavior. We saw last year AT&T on their wireless network uh, refuse to make an application that Apple sells called FaceTime available to everybody who got wireless service from AT&T. They said you can have it as long as you pay us for unlimited voice minutes and as long as you're paying us on a metered basis for the data you use. A lot like that Comcast model. You know, you pay us twice as long as you keep paying us for unlimited voice, then you're free to go and substitute something else for it as long as that check is guaranteed and as long as we're getting paid as the carrier two or even three times, sure, go off then and innovate and, and you know, have fun, but only once they have discriminated against the competitive content, the innovative application that might take away some of their legacy business. I said the open internet rules have worked to some degree. Of course, it's no secret that Free Press was not happy with a lot of the compromises struck when that order was adopted in 2010 by the FCC. Uh, lots of open internet advocates were not satisfied with those compromises. I'll just touch on three really quickly and finish as the third one on the authority piece, which is, as Susan said, you know, maybe not as compelling as the First Amendment piece, but is very important in the case. And in fact, will come first, most likely in the case. The judges will first consider whether the FCC has authority to adopt these rules at all. The first compromise we did not like was this wireless disparity that we've talked about in the past, where the FCC has different rules that apply to wireless and wired networks. And the way that plays out is that on a wireless network, the carrier has no obligation to uphold non-discrimination principles. They can basically say, you know, we feel like charging you more for this application because we can, 
and try and stop us. And, and that, that's allowed, or at least it's conscient by the FCC's rules, if not encouraged. Uh, they also said that the wireless carriers could not block applications that compete with their own telephony services. So think of something like Skype or Google Voice or fill in your favorite. Those are protected, but other applications like a video application, a music app, a social media app, those could be fair game, not just for discrimination, not just for differential treatment, but for blocking by the ISP. That's the first problem, the wireless disparity. Second problem, I'll talk about even more briefly, where there are a lot of loopholes in the FCC order, and we have Angie Cronenberg here on our panel, and I hate to talk about the FCC and, and some incomplete definitions they might have left in the order because they all worked so hard to make this important statement and preserve these principles for us. But things like, this might set off some nightmares for some people in the audience who spent years working on this, but things like reasonable network management, whatever that may mean, or managed services, which really nobody has defined even to this day. There are these kinds of loopholes and landmines in the order that may be very legitimate ways for ISPs to manage their network and may be ways for them to abuse that privilege and abuse their gatekeeper power. Third way in which the order was unsatisfactory to us and to a lot of people was this authority basis. And Susan touched upon this, so I'll try to finish quickly and turn it over to the rest of our all-star panel to talk about the real-world implications of this authority question, not get too lost in the dry legal part of it. But basically what the FCC has done for the last decade or more is continue down this mistaken path of saying, you know, the Internet and Internet access services more precisely are not really transmission services. They're kind of like a transmission service, but they're also different enough that we don't have the same kind of authority over them as we do over something like a telephone network. However, we still have some authority, and it's you know very much unclear as to what that authority is. I wouldn't say that's necessarily a wrong argument or a bad legal theory. It's just not the cleanest one the FCC has available to it. And so the question in this case really on the authority issue is not, will this be the end of the line for the FCC? They have other options available to them that we think they can and frankly should have taken a long time ago. But it might be the end of this sort of regulatory twilight zone in which broadband internet access service and other broadband telecommunication services have lived for the better part of the last decade now and now through two presidential administrations. And that's what we're going to see as the argument plays itself out and as the judges finally render a decision sometime later this year or maybe early next year if it slips that long is does the FCC have this authority it claims over network management practices or does it need to go back and try yet again? The problem is that this is not only something that affects net neutrality. If the FCC is given a broad decision and a broad loss, I agree that a narrow loss is, is more likely, um, but if it's given a broad loss, they might be told, you know, you have no authority whatsoever over broadband communications, over modern communications networks. And that would be a disaster because we need the FCC to make sure we have a level playing field so that competitive companies like those Angie now represents are available to provide service to people. And most importantly, so that constituencies and communities like those that Marty and Stephen are here to represent have access to that world-class modern communications network that we still very much need, even as the technology and the content running over it changes. So that's more than enough from me. I'll stop there and just ask Angie if I've missed anything, if I got anything wrong about the compromises that were made during that very uh, exciting, I guess might be one word for it, but also a very tense time at the FCC three years ago. Yeah, I'd like to give just a little bit of the perspective that I had as a legal advisor to Commissioner Clyburn. And I will admit that her whole team, her legal team, was involved in the consideration of the FCC's order. But I was primarily responsible for um, representing the commissioner as we reviewed the order and had discussions with our fellow commissioners, the chairman's office, and the staff. I wanted to take us back and just broaden um, a little bit about what was going on at the time uh, that we were considering the FCC order. First, there was wide public support for the Commission to act, to do something. Why is this? Well, I think it was because folks began to realize how important it is to have access to the Internet as we had all grown to love it, to be able to access video, voice alternatives. Um, to be able to surf the web, check the Washington Post website, the New York Times, and this idea that we'd have to pay more or the content provider would have to pay more to reach us was sort of a scary idea. How is that going to change what it is that consumers were doing every single day with the internet? In addition, there was a huge economy growing around the internet. And we'd seen lots of innovation, alternative options, new competition, and that's very exciting, especially because 
it's really expensive to reach consumers. And here's an alternative to reach consumers in a new and exciting way. Many of the staff had grown up during this internet age. I began work in the mid-90s. I remember when you couldn't attach anything to an email. I remember when we used to talk about whether or not you'd be able to provide voice or video service over the internet. So the idea that we had actually gotten to this place, I think we all were a little humbled at the FCC. We wanted to be sure that we were taking steps to protect consumers, but at the same time, the rules wouldn't be so onerous that we really would halt or, um, alter or somehow stop new innovations that could happen that would benefit consumers. Um, another thing I wanted to point out to you all is that Congress had actually become quite aware of how important the internet was. In the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Congress had directed the commission to spend time and money putting together a national broadband plan. How can we get broadband? How can we get high-speed internet access to all Americans? That's affordable. And then they also provided in that act $7.2 billion to build broadband in America to make sure that all consumers would have access to this new exciting service. They recognized it very much like how electric service had been when it first began, how telephone service began, and realized that this helps equal the, the playing field for consumers and provides them new opportunities. Here are ways that we can create economic opportunities and rural America. Um, and the president, too, had included an open internet uh, policy in his presidential platform. So these broad discussions were going on, the importance of an open internet going on. And I think the commission, you know, really wanted to ensure that one, yes, consumers can have access to this open internet. They have the opportunity to speak. They have the opportunity to reach competitive um, opportunities. And, um, and at the same time, we were very humbled with the position um, that we were in. And we wanted high level rules that would provide this. And we knew that, that yes, it wasn't going to please everyone. And perhaps that meant that we actually got to the right compromise, that on both sides, not everyone was happy. Um, I now have a different hat on. I represent Comtel, which is the trade association representing competitive carriers. And the non-discrimination principles that are in the open internet order and in the rules are really important. The commission laid out very clearly in this order how it is that large ISPs who also have alternative services, video services, voice services, have an incentive to discriminate against competitors. So small companies that are trying to compete over the internet um, and offer alternative services to consumers would be put at a disadvantage without these rules. And so that's the perspective that I wanted to provide both from my old position and in my new position. And I'm happy to be here and to continue this discussion with you all. Great. Well, thank you, Angie. We'll definitely want to hear more from you about how your current members and the people you represent today are uh, put at a disadvantage when we don't have certainty about just how the communications network and this public network hang together and serve everybody and you know the, the kind of benefits that your, your members can provide. But as I said earlier, not with no offense to the businesses that are impacted by this rule, I think even more important are the real people and communities who are impacted by these rules and by lack of certainty about their communications future. And that's why we're so excited to have Marty and Stephen here. Marty from AARP, obviously a, a powerful voice on a lot of issues that are in play here in Washington, but especially on this issue as well and on the impacts that lack of affordable and universal communication services can have on all Americans, but especially on aging populations who have as much need as anybody for these for these services, but maybe don't always adapt to the newest service instantly and need to have some kind of certainty in all of this changing technology landscape. So please, Marty, whatever you'd like to share about the okay. impacts your members have seen. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, New America Foundation. And... Um, uh, colleagues here at the dais uh, for this great opportunity to talk about uh, potential impacts to the 50 plus population 
uh, regarding uh, this decision that uh, or the hearing next week and, and the imminent decision. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with a membership of more than 37 million. That and we help people turn their goals, particularly the 50 plus population, they turn their goals and dreams into possibilities, real possibilities. We help to strengthen communities and we fight for the issues that matter most to families, we believe, such as health care employment and income security, retirement planning, affordable utilities, yes, and protection from financial abuse. Uh, broadband services, the technology itself, many of, the, of you in the room are um, much more defined specialists and experts than myself, but I can tell you that at AARP, we see uh, broadband as a successful connector for the 50 plus population. We understand that while all people have a fundamental need to stay connected to one another or be part of a wider community, being connected is particularly important for the 50 plus population. Older adults uh, find out later in life many times that there are more potential opportunities uh, after the age of 50 than before, such as uh, becoming an entrepreneur, you know, starting new businesses, just coming up with those, uh, those dreams and goals that they wish they had thought of and proceeded with when they were 20. But now after a life full of work, they have an opportunity to, to engage in that. This 50 plus population in this country is, is growing very rapidly and projected to increase by 21% by 2020. And those over 65 growing by 33% by the year 2020, which is just a minute away. All of the communities in all of this nation really need to go to work and find ways to keep this very large and vibrant, growing 50 plus population not only engaged, but also connected. Um, we'd like to talk about the technology infrastructure and broadband and the implications and the impacts for this population. We know that lifelong learning opportunities are, are very high on the list for the 50 plus population. And they get an opportunity to study in local institutions of higher education and intergenerational uh, access to public schools and community facilities. Access to public services offered by federal, state, and local governments where information on critical, life-saving, and life-enhancing benefits are online now. And those populations or those adults who have no access or who have limited access really value broadband and the internet to get it to getting to those benefits. And again, I mentioned access to entrepreneurial and small business startup opportunities, very important. Want to talk very quickly uh, so we can move to questions and answers about um, how we see this rapid technological change happening in telecommunications. Uh, AARP firmly believes that as the technology evolves, consumer protections cannot become obsolete. They must move and transition with the technology. There is no stopping point. There is no tipping point. They must move as the technology evolves for the protection of the consumers and in the nation's public interest as well. We know that um, the classification issue is at the core uh, or at the heart of a lot of the distress right now regarding uh, the hearing next week and other telecommunications issues. Uh, we try to help our members understand the difference uh, regarding the classification, telecommunication services. Uh, the FCC has um, so, so much more authority under that right, under that classification, as opposed to the information service. Uh, so we try to help our members understand the difference. But um, network neutrality, uh, AARP supports an open internet. We support uh, the consumer's right to access information openly uh, without discrimination of content or service. So we are firmly supporters in that camp. We believe that policymakers should ensure that consumers have the right to use their internet connections to access, to use, send, receive, or offer any lawful content or services that they choose over the internet. And that consumers should also have the right to attach any device um, to the operator's broadband network as long as that device does not damage or degrade the uh, subscriber's use of the network or other subscriber's use of the network. Um, 
AARP is very supportive of the FCC's role as a gatekeeper over this very critical, vibrant, rapidly changing technology and its infrastructure. We believe that the FCC has a role and it must be maintained, it must be protected. Broadband is no longer the fledgling technology of the 80s and 90s, um, needing the nurturing of a light touch or a restrained touch of, of regulations. Instead, broadband technology and what the internet represents right now is a very full-grown, robust uh, technology and industry that's very critical to our nation and it's uh, the, the public interest of our, of our nation and very critical to our 50 plus population and quality of life issues as all of us age. We feel that the public for its patience, its encouragement, and to a great extent its subsidization, subsidization of this great innovation technology broadband deserves a federal communications commission whose role will be to protect strengthen universal access of not only connectivity, but of the content and the services that the internet will offer. Great, thank you so much, Marty. We'll, we'll come back to you as well, and I wanna get Sarah back in and everybody else down there too, but let's finish last but not least with Stephen. I mean, Marty talked about broadband as I, I, I would say it as the basic communications platform today, no longer something that is fledgling. What does it mean for communities who don't have access to that basic connectivity? What kind of impacts do we see when we don't have equal and open access and affordable access for every population, not just those few who can afford to buy it from Verizon when they claim it's theirs and they can edit it if they want to? Thank you, Matt. Uh, you know, first of all, thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's uh, an extreme honor to be on this panel with so many folks that I have uh, the deepest amount of respect for, and I'm just humbled to be here. Um, so. I'm here uh, with the Center for Media Justice, and uh, but I should be truthful, who I'm actually here representing are the 160 members of the Media Action Grassroots Network, uh, which is a national network that we coordinate um, with membership across the country. Um, and for us, the open internet really has an impact uh, to three areas. We know that it's vital to the health and well-being of the communities that are represented through our network, uh, which are very much so communities of color, rural communities, um, uh, low-income, poor, and working-class communities. Uh, it's vital towards their health and well-being. It's, it's important um, in protecting the public interest, and in particular, those, vulner those same vulnerable communities um, that without these protections uh, can be priced out of this vital infrastructure or sometimes relegated uh, towards a second-class internet um, that impacts their ability to communicate effectively and participate in this kind of global 21st century economy. Uh, and lastly, we see an impact being the open internet is vital in protecting a platform that has democratized our communications um, and really provided us a, an effective platform, uh, a dissident platform, where we can voice our opposition. And I'll, I'll go into each of those uh, a little bit more. Um, for us, this case is about control and ownership of this vital infrastructure. And these are pre-existing uh, tensions that communities of color, uh, rural communities, poor and working class communities are all too familiar with. Um, you know, one of our network members, uh, Young People's Project, uh, which is an organization in Mississippi, they, they run this math and digital literacy uh, program for children in elementary, middle school, and high school um, because they know how critical these skills are to a quality education. Um, and they're engaged in this work trying to connect education to digital literacy just because it's, it's, it's so vital. Um, around jobs, broadband has been this engine behind economic development. Uh, there's an interesting study done by the Center for Social Inclusion in the Mississippi NAACP um, that took a look at broadband in the Mississippi Delta and they analyzed zip codes and looked at how many broadband providers were in each of those zip codes. In zip codes that had four to seven uh, broadband providers, internet service providers, there were about 378 businesses. In zip codes that had zero, there were about seven. Um, and it's no surprise that a lot of those zip codes very much dovetailed over with rural communities, uh, uh, poor communities, uh, communities of color. So what we learned from these struggles is that when we lack agency over these critical infrastructures, our communities suffer. 
Um, this case and the fight for an open internet is our fight uh, because it's directly tied to all of our other fights for community health and well-being. Um, and, you know, as, as other folks have kind of alluded to, there's uh, corporations are oftentimes always trying to look for more ways to uh, you know, make more profit, which is natural. They're corporations. So when profit making inevitably conflicts with the public interest, you know, in a lot of cases, profit making usually wins out. Uh, but it doesn't have to be this way. Network neutrality is a principle that protects the public. And when this erodes, uh, we face an internet ecosystem that preys on the public. You know, we look shortly after the FCC implemented its network neutrality rules, Metro PCS, um, you know, came out with a tiered data plan. You know, you could pay 40 bucks and you'd get unlimited, what they called unlimited um, web, you know, web browsing. Um, and you could get unlimited, uh, I think, uh, unlimited YouTube. For a little bit more, you can get additional websites. And we start seeing this kind of tiered structure that is very similar to us when we think about cable. Uh, well, Metro PCS is a, is a company that, well, now it's T-Mobile. But uh, Metro PCS was a company back then who was specifically marketing towards communities of color. So think about the internet experience that we're inviting people into um, when we don't have these vital protections. Um, so when corporations are in a position to pick winners and losers, uh, the losers tend to be those most vulnerable communities, communities of color, poor, working class communities. Without an open internet, um, we are denied yet again one more platform, and argu arguably for us in our day and age, the biggest platform to express our opinions that reflect the best interest of our communities. Um, this is relevant now more than ever as the President and Congress debate you know, what action to take in Syria. Um, it's vitally important that we have access to media platforms that allow us to oppose military force, to call for a peaceful intervention, that allow us to hear the stories of groups like the, the Iraq Veterans Against the War and challenge the obvious anti-Muslim racism that we see that is so much part of the mainstream media. Um, you know, I think a lot about in this particular issue, a lot of the companies that um, you know, are against network neutrality are the same companies that have provided this massive amounts of data to the NSA, um, you know, the, of users all across the U.S. Um, and an open internet was the platform that allowed for us to hear of these secret surveillance programs and come to light. It's been the online communities that have fought back against uh, policies like SOPA and PIPA. Uh, it's, it's a vital platform that allows us to build power and challenge when it's necessary. So just in conclusion, I think those are the three pieces that we really see as important. We need an open internet for our health and well-being. We need the open internet for, uh, to protect the public interest and protect those, those most vulnerable. And we need the open internet as a platform uh, for dissent. Thank you, Stephen. That was very compelling. Um, I, I want to take a moment and just uh, broaden the scope a bit um, and think a little bit about this worst case scenario that Susan described earlier, where the, the court would just sort of issue a sweeping ruling that says the FCC has no authority to regulate broadband. And to think about other policies beyond <coughs> net neutrality and the open internet order um, that, that this lack of authority would affect. Um, and I can start off by, by flagging um, the Universal Service Fund. And I think that probably Marty and Angie could could add to this, but what we're seeing in, in work at the FCC and in, in trying to broaden the scope of the fund or the, broaden the scope of the things supported within the Universal Service Fund to include broadband service in the context of Lifeline, um, the Lifeline program, which provides a discount for um, low cost uh, telephone service. We've seen calls from groups across the country to expand this program to allow it to support standalone broadband. And we've also seen a, a sort of inability or um, an inability at the FCC to work and, and extend those regulations to include broadband within the lifeline. We, I know we've gotten there partially, but um, to actually support broadband as a standalone service within the lifeline fund. And so I know um, there, there's lots of 
the, the scope of the regula regulatory authority over um, traditional telephone companies involves much more than, than non-discrimination, and so I'd kind of like to dig in a little bit to some of these other related issues that, that might be affected. Well, actually, my worst case scenario is even worse than that, oh, which would be that uh, there'd be no congressional authority to delegate power to the FCC to act. And what you get then is just a continuation of the status quo, which is divided markets. You take wired, I'll take wireless, able to charge whatever you want for whatever kind of services you want to provide. It just becomes another, it just becomes a private limousine service that some people get access to, some people don't. And uh, so all the positive, we call them positive externalities, economists love to do this, all the great things that happen for society because we have things like a postal system and uh, we have the federal highway system in America, we've got uh, communications networks, f the phone anyway, reached everybody at, at an equal level. That huge competitive advantage for the country is whittled away because we'll have uh, a few people, uh, the more affluent, who will be able to get access to still second-class networks, but better than their less well-off brethren will. Uh, new businesses won't be able to rely on a common interface, so they'll risk having the rug pulled out from under them when they want to attract new investment and they want to get launched. Uh, we won't have uh, equivalent access to health care for Americans, education, all kind. every social policy goal we care about is undermined by not having universally available, ubiquitous, world-class, interconnected internet access. Uh, and we won't get that without having uh, some oversight because left to their own devices, we'll get what we've got, which is uh, the status quo and a deeply uh, profit-driven enterprise, as Steve described. And I also uh, would like to uh, emphasize, once again, I think it's been mentioned by a couple of people on the panel already, there are still pockets of uh, populations in this country that have no access, uh, a very limited access, rudimentary access to even phone service. Uh, great phone service, uh, not to mention even broadband, internet, and so forth. So uh, the the demise of the FCC as a gatekeeper, as a preserver of public interest, um, in in that respect, would already turn communities that are struggling to survive uh, with no providers to probably what I would like to say wastelands, because economic development doesn't happen. Um, populations who want to continue to generation after generation, that's not going to happen. But we still have places in this country, and without an FCC, a gatekeeper, a public interest role, those places may never get service. And those places with, with limited service would have a very difficult time in attracting the, the profit-driven provider to come into those communities. So just want to speak to those rural populations and other places that really don't have what we see in Washington, D.C. and other urban areas in this country. And what we do know is that Congress had that concern already and specifically devoted money towards building projects so that more consumers could have access to high-speed internet service. And we also know that a commission who has a statute that hasn't been updated since 1996 looked at Section 254 and its lifeline reform, which occurred um, about a year and a half ago, put together a pilot program for broadband internet access service for low-income consumers, relied upon pieces of the statute that are relied upon in the open internet access case to do that, you know, has this pilot project that's ongoing right now so that they can turn the Lifeline program into not just a voice subsidy program, but also a broadband subsidy program. And as you indicated, Sarah, yes, the commission already permits um, the subsidy uh, for purposes of packages so that if a consumer is buying both a voice and a broadband package, it can be subsidized. But it's still the same amount of money that the subsidy is. So, you know, and it's not apparent that there are a lot of companies that are currently offering that service to low income subscribers in the Lifeline program. So if the court, even if it shuts down the First Amendment case, OK, so Congress still has authority that it can delegate to the FCC. If they somehow limit the authority that the FCC's already been delegated, and we have to go back to Congress, the commission has to go back to Congress in order to be able to ensure that low-income consumers can be served 
served that they can get access to broadband internet access through subsidies. Um, it's going to take a while for that to happen, and that's that's a that's a concern. Um, if the court doesn't shut down the whole thing at this point and say, and uphold the commission's statutory authority, the 706A authority, the 706B authority, um, the language that's in various portions that have been tied back related to the service of video, the service of voice, um, and the 230 provision that was relied upon by the FCC. So I would even go um, really stress even beyond what uh, Susan has stressed is like they really need to, to uphold the FCC at this time. And the FCC to have to go back and redo the amount of time that that would take the FCC and the amount, the political pressure that the FCC go, would feel from the public and from the companies. Um, I really think this is not a great use of government resources. This question has been asked and answered, and the court should uphold it, and we should move on, because there are many other things that the FCC needs to work on, including finishing up that pilot project and making sure that low-income consumers have access to affordable broadband internet access service. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for me, you know, part of what I think about is I'm, I'm in this kind of interesting generation where I'm old enough to have gone to school and at times when I didn't necessarily need access to the internet. But I was also the first person on my block when I was growing up in Los Angeles uh, to get a computer and have a dial-up connection. And, you know, I was like the go-to person for every, every query. Um, but nowadays, when I go back, uh, my cousin lives with my mom now, and she, she has a broadband connection, a cable connection at home because she needs it because she goes to college. Uh, my cousin next door, who's in high school, uh, regularly on a daily basis, utilizes her computer to co to finish her homework. Um, you know, the, to, for me, so the, for me, the doomsday uh, scenario is more about what the impact is going to be to people in their homes, out in communities, and this is an infrastructure that is now being utilized for so many critical things. I mean, I've helped my mom complete her taxes online. I've helped uh, family members look for jobs online, look for directions. I mean, this is like everyday survival stuff. Uh, and, and I think Angie's absolutely right. There's, we got to keep moving forward. And, um, you know, this authority question, what's interesting is it's, it's a very critical question, but it's also interesting to me because it reminds me of a Four Tops song, uh, Same Old Song. Uh, it's the same old song. <laughs> you know, every time the FCC decides to do something, it seems like, and, and the carriers don't like it, they respond by saying, well, the FCC doesn't have the authority to do that. Um, and we've seen that recently. We just completed our network was part of a campaign um, uh, to lower the cost of phone calls from prisons, and the FCC um, did such an amazing job in in addressing an issue that had been long-standing um, at the commission for over a decade and you know Angie was very much involved in that so first of all thank you um, and you know what are the carriers saying they didn't like it they didn't want it they didn't want to be regulated so they're saying the FCC has no authority so in some ways like these arguments come up time and time again anytime the FCC tries to do something so um, yes it's a, it's a very important question but come on <laughs> well and I think you know without really questioning Angie's obviously true statement that this will tie the commission up in knots politically. I wonder if we could go back to that point a little bit, though, and, and to get past the same old song that Stephen's rightly referring to. I mean, people will say sometimes, well, if the FCC does that, if they do the right thing, they'll be sued. Heavens. I, they, they get sued no matter what they do. And you know, a lot of our advice to them at the time of the open internet order drafting was at least get sued for the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, do the, do the strong thing, do the right thing, and you're going to get sued no matter what, but go in with your strongest theory. Set that aside for a moment, though. Obviously, this would, if the FCC chose to uh, redo the order based on some kind of narrow remand, would be a big political fight. But again, put that aside for a minute, the open internet rules, net neutrality. Angie, if you could talk about the knots that your companies, uh, that are Comtel members, have to tie themselves into just to navigate the current system that we have, where... They can't even necessarily interconnect, a word that Susan's talked about a lot. They can't necessarily even connect to a Verizon or a Comcast or somebody else and be guaranteed that they can send traffic to one another based on nothing more than the technology they're using or the type of facility, you know, whether it's a copper wire or a cable wire. 
But you know, they're providing the same service. They're providing a vital service, this communication service that we still need very much for our economy and our society. And yet it's, I think, your companies who have to deal with the regulatory arbitrage and the games that the incumbents play to make that as difficult as possible for their competitors. Yes, it does seem like it's the same old song. So uh, what Matt's referring to is that Congress did provide for provisions in Title II in the 1996 Act to open up the local markets and specifically the local phone markets for competition. And as we see more companies transitioning to new technology, such as internet protocol transmission, they are now arguing this is internet, therefore, you know, you the commission shouldn't regulate it the same way that it, it's regulated the traditional TDM service. And they do not want to interconnect with competitive carriers. And they want the commission to treat it as though it's going to be all over the top and internet peering will take care of the situation. And our position is, is that this is not internet peering arrangements. These are voice products that are managed services, just like TDM is managed today over the carriers networks in fact they all advertise their voice over internet protocol services as not being um, carried over the internet and we continue to have that fight with them um, and so there is a lot of spillover the arguments that you've seen before you see again proceeding after proceeding and the commission's um lack of determination about how to classify services, how to treat services, and then it does have to tie itself up in knots in order to enact consumer protections. And occasionally we find out, well, here's a consumer protection on interconnected VoIP that hasn't been covered, such as a recent case on slamming. Who knew that, um, as it turns out, if you're a consumer and your voice product gets switched over to an interconnected VoIP service without your permission, if you file a slamming complaint at the FCC, they're going to dismiss it because they haven't um, said that those slamming rules apply to interconnected VoIP service, even though in many other contexts they apply the same telephone consumer protections for interconnected VoIP service. So yes, this is, it, it makes it difficult for our members. Um, you know, we are concerned about exactly what steps the commission will take, what authority it will be viewed as having by the courts to ensure there's a level competitive playing field. Why is this so important to consumers? Because if consumers have choice, they'll have innovative services offered to them, usually at cheaper prices. Um, they will have alternatives. If they don't like their service from Verizon, they can go to somebody else. This is a good thing. This is what the 96 Act intended, and we want to see those provisions continue. So Angie, you mentioned in your earlier statements this, you highlighted the widespread political and social support uh, back in the days of the, the, the original drafting of the Open Internet Order. And given this sort of regu this regulatory arbitrage that Matt highlighted and that your stories exemplify, th and the fact that um, as we're seeing more and more um, companies are moving away from traditional telephone technologies and into uh, phone systems delivered over the internet. Th so we're, we're seeing a, an, a shrinking of a, a base of um, companies and entities that these rules are actually protecting. So as we transition over, this is sort of, um, be we're reaching a critical moment. So I'm curious, um, wh where are we now when it comes to this political and social support? And um, have we missed the moment? Have we? No, I think, um, I think there's a lot of confusion. And I don't want to you know, put you on the spot, but even there's some confusion in what you just said, Sarah, because the numbers actually show not much of the voice service is actually over the internet right now. The use of IP, internet protocol, is a transmission technology. It doesn't mean it goes over the internet. And so through this confusion, well, it has internet in the name. Therefore, it's going over the internet. Um, I have something to tell you all. That's not true. And that's a misconception that my association is spending a lot of time trying to correct. And so 
you know, as it turns out, there there are some folks that are choosing to have their voice products over the internet, and that's great, and we want to encourage that. We think that that's really important. But it's also true that there continue to be managed voice products for consumers. In fact, well over the majority of residential consumers are choosing it, and almost all business consumers do. And that's because for business consumers, they need to absolutely make sure they have good quality of service. And the internet is a best efforts network. It doesn't offer the same kind of guarantees that the telephone network has traditionally offered and that is so important for so many consumers. I have to tell you, it's even important to me as a residential consumer with two young kids in my house. I don't rely solely on my mobile service. I still continue to purchase a triple play that includes a voice product because I absolutely want to be sure that I can stay in contact with my friends and family and loved one and God forbid if there's an emergency in my house. And that managed VoIP product that I get from Verizon is a managed VoIP product that does not travel over the internet. And in fact, you can go on their website and they'll tell you that. So that's, that is, I just want to be really clear so folks understand. Um, and it does, the commission, the lack of certainty and definition from the commission's perspective, and it hasn't defined what interconnected VoIP is, it continues to be a problem. And sometimes it isn't even a problem that they foresee, such as the slamming situation. You have Enforcement Bureau who's looking at the slamming rules and going, oh, well, we can't handle this complaint. And one thing else I should have mentioned, most likely the state couldn't either, because so many states have deregulated VoIP services. So where's the consumer supposed to go? How is the consumer going to be protected? from that. And so it is important that the commission, you know, that they address issues head on. And the politics, yes, the politics are hard. I've been there before. And, you know, I've also been in the situation where I'm begging the chairman's office to make the hard decision. Um, and this is when it's very helpful to have the grassroots and the consumers say, we want these protections. And it's so important for the commission to do its job and protect consumers. Um, and, in, and especially in light of the fact that there are, you know, about 50% of the states that have deregulated. So the FCC is the last agency that can protect the consumers. And yeah, I, just, yeah. I just want to thank Angie for the clarification. Uh, but also it highlights uh, the necessity and, and the dire situation we have, AARP and other consumer advocacy groups, particularly with the state legislatures and state utility commissions who don't have the best information. They may have the best lobbyist that the carrier can provide, but they don't have the best information. And they get a lot of conflicting information as to um, where their authority begins and where it ends and where the FCC is able to step in and what its role will be in terms of being a stopgap. So I just want to speak up for the consumer groups who are fighting at the state level who are dealing with legislatures and utility commissions who are getting these mixed messages uh, about the FCC's role. And at the state level, they're saying, don't worry, deregulate. The FCC will be there while here in Washington, they're doing everything to make sure that the FCC will not be there. So you have state regulators who are confused by what lobbyists sell them. You have real people who I think are confused. I think that's exactly right, Angie. And I think it goes back to something Marty talked about earlier, Stephen touched on, Susan touched on. And maybe, maybe we can finish there with some final thoughts from all of you before we start taking questions. One of the benefits of being in D.C. is we have as many experts in the audience, if not more, <laughs> yeah. than you have up here in front of you. So I'm interested to hear what questions we might get. But you know, there's this confusion, and I think the confusion stems from not lack of concern or care about these issues, but just simple disbelief that suddenly consumer protections don't apply. You know, I can call anybody I want to on my phone. What do you mean I can't do that with an email? Or what do you mean I can't do that with a website? Right. Why would that be different just because the technology has improved or changed? Why would suddenly I not have the same types of rights, both economically speaking and uh, from a uh, internet, internet freedom standpoint, you know, from a democratic standpoint, why can't I go and find that dissent 
that Stephen's talking about, because the ISP has the right to choose which sites I can go to or who I can talk to. I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from and, and really where the ISPs have been so successful at muddying the waters for people. Yeah, and, and you know, it almost makes you smile because from the consumer's, protection, uh, consumer's perspective, these are just general purpose transport networks. I mean, you're supposed to be able to pick up the equivalent of modern day equivalent of the phone and do whatever it is you need to do. And it should be world class and interconnected and work. We're America, we're always supposed to be number one. And yet, steadily, at the state level, at the local level, at the federal level, all of that structure is being removed. And this case is absolutely central to that uh, very well thought out campaign. And the problem is that there is enough of a shell game, you know, maybe it's not going over the internet, but it's going over the same pipe provided by the same guy. So, you know, and everything keeps moving around and redefined and defined broadly, and yet it shouldn't be that difficult. This is our basic general purpose transport communications network. It's the substitute for the telephone. It should be treated that way, but without clear congressional authority, clear FCC authority, and by the way, a very strong role for the states who can pick up the phone. The FCC can't pick up 300 million phones and respond to people's consumer com protection complaints. There is a very important role for the states to play. So we've got to get them back into that position. We've got this opportunity now in the next couple of years to move this ship around. And I am hopeful that whatever happens with the FCC's legal gymnastics on the open internet r rule itself, we'll see a wholesale move towards this as a very important social policy issue for the entire country. And on that note, we do have state commissioners who are engaged on these issues, and we need more of them. Mm -hmm. NARUC, which is the organization that represents the state utility commissioners, the president of NARUC put together a task force, and they just released their white paper on the cooperative federalism and the state work that needs to happen with new networks. And so I encourage you all to go to their website, look at this paper, but we need to have more of that discussion of how how we have this engagement of the states, the state commissioners, the state legislatures, and the FCC all working together to ensure there's a level competitive playing field so that we all have options as consumers, whether we're residential consumers or, or business consumers, and that uh, we, we all know that competition is one of the best ways to protect consumers offer innovation and lower prices, but then also there need to be those basic consumer protections in place that Susan's talked about, that Steve's talked about, that Marty's talked about, that absolutely ensure that folks get the kinds of guaranteed service that they've always had and they rely on, and that they don't have to understand the legal distinctions when they're using the internet versus when they're using their wireless phone versus when they're using a wired phone. What I would add uh, just really quickly is that, you know, part of what we've tried to do um, with the Media Action Grassroots Network is really bring that grassroots voice to a lot of these places, not just the FCC, but also at the state level. A lot of our member organizations were involved in California in the unsuccessful uh, uh, campaign there to stop a deregulation bill. Um, but we need to also be able to organize people and organize those stories to not be able to provide those technical distinctions, but be able to share what the potential impact is to their everyday lives. Um, so for folks out there in the interwebs, um, <laughs> feel free to hit us up. Magnet is where it's at. And with that, I think we can open it up to questions. And speaking of the interwebs, um, if I, I, we have some folks monitoring the Twitter feed for the hashtag, so um, we'll try to at least get one or two questions from from uh, from the Twitter feed as well. Wow, uh, Earl, I think that your hand went up first. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Earl Comstock. Uh, it seems to me, I think the panel's done a great job of sort of presenting some things here, but I, I have to say there's sort of an elephant in the room that's being overlooked, and I think you'd clarify for your audience a tremendous amount if you'd address this. You know, the reality is, Angie, you mentioned that, you know, it's been since the 96 Act that this was done. Well, I'll just remind everybody that the 96 Act was written 60 years after the 34 Act, and Congress did know about the internet. There was a lot done in the, in the 80s and 90s on the internet. So I would maintain the statute does address the internet. And I think it would be helpful for your listeners to understand that in the event that you get past this First Amendment argument, and in the event that the FCC goes down on 706, which I think they probably should, you know, the reality is the FCC was given the tools by Congress to address all of this advanced networks. Um, and I'd like you to maybe educate the listeners on the fact that in the event that 
the court strikes down the rationale put forward by the FCC, all is not lost. You don't need a new statute. You could go back and address these things as they've been done before. And I, I, I feel like everybody's tiptoeing around the okay. fact that the FCC got itself into this box by basically defining what Angie rightly points out is something over IP as somehow outside their grasp. And then they sort of scrambled around the edges looking for provisions of law that they could point to to say, oh, but we, we didn't give it all away. We just gave away all the important stuff. <laughs> um, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about how Title II, Title III, and Title VI might actually continue to apply in the event that the FCC went back and revisited their definitions. Absolutely, um, and I did not intend to tiptoe around it, <laughs> but <laughs> the commission reclassified bribing and service, bribing internet access service as an information service. They first did that for cable modem service, and then they did that for DSL service. Um, and so the, that is one option. The commission could go back and look at those decisions and say, no, we're going to classify the service as a Title II service. And then it clearly has all the authority it needs, and it could even price regulate if it wanted to. Um, it also could do other things. Instead of classifying broadband internet access service as Title II, it could classify the broadband transmission under Title II and then make it available on a wholesale basis to competitors and create a more vibrant competitive market for broadband services so that other providers could offer an open internet to service to consumers. So I think all of that, though, will be very politically difficult um, inside the Beltway if that's what the commission would be left to do. And it is, it's, it's very hard to speculate you know, exactly what a court would say if they were striking down um, what it is that the commission had relied upon. Um, but yes, there's a series of decisions that occurred um, in the prior commission under prior administration. They left it in the position that it was in. And um, the FCC that I was a part of you know, made the decision not to go forward uh, with a reclassification. It has an open proceeding as part of that discussion. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it didn't was because it was just too hard to do it. There was such an outcry um, that it shouldn't do that, that it should go this particular route and see what a court says. I'm glad you think I'm so graceful, Earl, that I tiptoed around it, but I, I felt like I you know, stepped on it a few times. I mean, the FCC <laughs> has twisted itself into knots. No, but thank you for, for bringing it up again because I think it is important. I mean, it's, it's very important that people not think this case, again, is somehow the end of the road for the FCC. It's just the end of this road, of that regulatory twilight I talked about earlier where they have tried to set, say, we have jurisdiction over broadband internet access service, but only in kind of convoluted ways. And maybe that holds up. Maybe the court will find that to be the case for these rules. It just isn't good enough, in our view, for all of the things and all of the responsibilities the FCC has under that act and all the roles they have to play to make sure we maintain this communications network uh, and don't let it somehow disappear just because the technology has changed. And I think our members would have real concerns, as I mentioned earlier, about the amount of time that it would take for the commission to make this decision, what the end result could be. Um, you know, one of the things that I would hear constantly from those lobbying me when I was on the eighth floor was, we need certainty, we need certainty, we need certainty, just make a decision. And so this puts us all back into more uncertainty. And there are other proceedings that are going on at the FCC that my members care about, special access reform. Um, reforming, modernizing the last mile uh, policies at the commission. And instead, we're going to rehash this. And the, the other responsibilities that the commission's been given that has, and they have deadlines, um, the incentive auction. You know, it's, this is not our preference. Our preference is for the court to make a decision to come out very clearly that this is not a First Amendment uh, right that Verizon, you know, has. That um, and it should shut down the claims that the commission's overstepped the authority that it has. It's time to move on. We need to be addressing larger issues. And it gets back to, you know, what else is, does the commission already have? What it, what they've already done and how that might impact, such as lifeline and high cost reform. And luckily, the e-rate reform that's before there's more specific provisions about advanced services. I don't think that's going to be affected, thank goodness. But, you know, it's, it's, we need to be having a different discussion. It's, it is time. 
for this to be shut down and let's do it here. And should this get to the Supreme Court, let's hope the Supreme Court does it again. And I'd like to point out, you know, we ha none of us has talked about the city of Arlington case. Um, the commission won the city of Arlington case, split the conservatives. I personally am really proud of that case. I was one of the primary authors of the underlying order at the FCC as a staffer in the Wireless Bureau. I was thrilled that the commission's Chevron deference um, was upheld for purposes of its jurisdiction and not just its general statutory authority. And so I really hope that the DC Circuit's gonna look at that they're going to look at all of the other provisions at the commission sites. It's um, redefinition of what 706 is, it's reinterpretation of 706 is, and uphold uh, the FCC so that we can get beyond this conversation, frankly, and talk about other things and, um, and ensuring that consumers have access to broadband. Go ahead. My name is Li Yang. Uh, first, I appreciate uh, this panelist discussion, but I always want to go back to our really basic principle: how we're going to improve everything, and uh, from the basic principles and uh, concept. For instance, uh, we want to uh, promote the equal, e equal opportunity and uh, equity and helping the poor and everything. All our commodities or goods, we have to base on the principles. So the internet and broadband is the same concept. Why do we have to limit it to just a small area while ignore all other areas the problem? For instance, uh, way back to the internet, we have a com computer, we had a phone, landline phone, everything. They have a big problem already. They, they have been, obstructed, diverted, so your, your business line will be not your line at all because they divert to other customers. So um, if we have this type of thing, if we don't resolve it, we have a big problem. And the reason that we have a phone rate, you know, in prison, the high rate is, is a big issue. So the problem is you have a bigger issue than that because they don't even allow you to use the phone. And they have a phone there for you to call the police. So just in case the patient or inmate got sick, you can call a, a police, but they line, the line is not working. So all, all these big issues, if we don't resolve it, we got a big problem. So whether there's uh, civil organizations, profit or non-profit, they don't base on justice. So if the people complain, they don't resolve it. Just the FCC, or they go to anywhere, they will obstruct people's complaint, they don't allow them to speak. So if we don't mess on this, we got the big issues. I mean, as, as, a, as a point of principle, our organization and our network believes that the right to communicate belongs to everyone. Um, you know, out there in, in this world, and I think you mentioned uh, the availability of broadband. What we're seeing is that broadband is becoming more and more available. But when we take a look at adoption rates, and there was an interesting survey that was recently published on the Daily Yonder um, that took a look at adoption rates in urban communities versus rural, they found that they took a look at adoption rates from 2003, compared those to 2010, found that virtually the gap hadn't really changed. Um, and in some cases, when you took a look at demographics, it actually got wider. So the digital divide in some places is growing, even though the availability of broadband is there, but it's either unaffordable or whatever mechanisms need to be in place in order for people to utilize this technology and communicate effectively in our 21st century digital ecology, uh, you know, it's, it's not there. That infrastructure isn't there. And obviously the FCC, state, and regulatory agencies play a very critical role in ensuring that people do develop that, that ability to communicate. Um, so that's what I'd say to that. I want to check with uh, our online monitors. Do we have any questions from... I have some online access over here, thanks to the interwebs that we oh. talked about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, I mean, I want to make sure we get this gentleman's question too, but something that's popped up time and again, and I don't know if, Susan, you want to jump in here or anybody sure. else. Uh, the question is, why can't the FTC uh. do this? Why is net neutrality anything more than just a substitute for antitrust? And I would, I would start to answer that by saying, well, the FTC, I don't know how effective they are at actually doing what they're supposed to do today, for one thing. But for two, you know, we're talking about 
pro-competitive policies at the FCC, but it's about more than that. It's about universal service and deployment and adoption issues and things that Marty and Stephen have talked about. It's about the communication network functioning for everybody, not just do we have options. So as Angie said earlier, competition is a great way, if you can get it, to in improve services for people, but it isn't the only thing that we should have in our toolbox, and it hasn't been enough in the current incumbent-dominated space to actually result in lower prices for people. I, you talk a lot about the second-rate networks that we're uh, often relegated to here. So that's terrific. So not only does antitrust just deal with a subset of the many social policy issues that attach to a, cons a communications network like internet access, mm -hmm. but also it inherently looks backwards and it only protects competitors. It protects competitors. Here we've got a marketplace where these guys don't really want to compete with each other. And they've divided up marketplaces all over the place. Uh, so it would be looking backward and would deal and would not, you can't, the, FT, the FTC cannot say you have to enter a market in order to serve people who are radically unserved. Only ex ante regulatory policy does that and can create the system of cross subsidies and everything else that needs to happen in order for everybody in America to have world class high speed internet access, which is where we should be. So the FTC, you know, has an interesting consumer protection role, but when it comes to making prophylactic regulatory rules that will protect nascent industries, only the expert administrative agency can do that. It also wouldn't pre prevent the kind of tiering that we see that Stephen talked about with Metro oh. PCS earlier. I mean, you can yeah. offer any kind of service you want and call it uh, basic communication service, but yet it's not. It's something that's a limited subset of that. Right, with Facebook on the front page. Right. <laughs> Sir. Right up front. <laughs> Bill Martin, now with the European Institute. I wanted to get back to that elephant uh, in the room. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm a little bit out of touch, but but uh, a couple of years ago, the um, the FCC lost this this the Comcast case, yeah. and I'm wondering uh, some of the same issues were at stake. I gather, and uh, is the FCC uh, arguing that that case should be uh, repealed, or are they going to? Is it can that be distinguished? Uh, or, you know, how serious is this congressional authorization issue? Well, it's very serious. Uh, I would say some people say that this second case, the one that's going to be heard on Monday, is like once more with feeling. Let's do it again. Uh, other, <laughs> other people say, um, no, we rewrote Section 706, or our understanding of what Section 706, part of the Communications Act, means. And Earl can talk to you about why that doesn't really do it. And, you know, and we've, we've established statutory authority based on pasting together several sections of the act. So that, that's the approach that's being taken by the FCC. And the elephant in the room is, why not rip off the Band-Aid, call this a telecommunication service under Title II? Then you could forbear from applying all kinds of things if you don't want them to weight down high-speed internet access provision. But at least you've got your basic statutory structure clear. But the point that it would be a very political argument is absolutely right. And so a problem is not having enough representatives in Congress who either understand this issue or are willing to stand up against the lobbyists who will assault them and say, we won't give you any more campaign contributions. Really deeply, that's where the problem is. This is all about campaign finance. So if the FCC tried to act aggressively, there's a real risk that their budget would be cut in half at the Appropriations Committee because the lobbyists would march on Congress. So that, you know, if you want to talk about elephants in the room, that's really the elephant in the room, is the problem of uh, congressional uh, ability to stand up to whatever happens in their offices. Elephants and donkeys, right. to be fair. Right, yes. <laughs> The commission is relying on several additional statutory um, provisions that were not in the original Comcast case, too, I should note. So. Do you have additional questions either here? Oh. Hi, Mark DeFalco with the Appalachian Regional Commission. So let's keep talking about that elephant. Yeah. Doesn't the FCC have the authority to, re to make the reclassification, if it so chose, and, and go from Title I to Title II? And then, yes, there would be fallout from that, but at least to be able to make that reclassification, isn't that in their uh, ability to do that right now? They do, but they have to have a reasoned basis for doing so. And, you know, it will go to court again. Um, but it's, it's clear from the Brand X decision that the commission has that authority to do that, um, but it must be able to explain why it's doing that. 
Brand X back in 2005 said not the FCC is correct in its determination on the merits here. It just said the FCC has the discretion to do this. They can decide that broadband internet access service is not really a telecom service and is in fact an information service, whatever those things mean in the statute. Justice Scalia in 2005 didn't agree with that. He said, no, the FCC got it wrong. They don't have the authority to read the law this way. They have to read it to say that a telecommunication service, something that lets you and me send information to each other, that's exactly what this internet or internet enabled or whatever other term you want to put on it, that's what that platform is. It is still a telecommunication service, even though there's lots of information riding over the top of it. But people who want to spin brand X and say that it uh, you know, confirm the FCC on the merits of this classification decision. They're just not reading it the right way. Okay. <laughs> we have to, we have time for uh, another question or two. I see that Earl has a follow up. <laughs> I, I was just going to add that, uh, you know, in in fairness, I wouldn't put all the burden on Congress. Really, the FCC could do this. That's what yeah. they're created to do, and. They have plenty of justification as the discussion of, of VoIP over the internet versus IP-enabled services talks about. I mean, the, the real problem is, is that they're just not willing to do it. And the fact that the FCC has left unclassified now for, what, the last 15 years, what is the status of a voice over internet protocol service, I think gives you a pretty good clue as to where the problem lies. The agency is very reluctant to tackle that issue for precisely the reason that they can't really explain what is the difference between a transmission service and an IP-based service. They, they, there is no fundamental technical difference. And so I, with all deference to people who say, oh, well, the problem is that Congress would cut the funding, um, as somebody who spent 10 years up there, I could say that that's not as likely to happen if the FCC made a principled stand, as some might think. Well, so let's be optimistic. <laughs> so that, let's say the D.C. Circuit says something very clear, you know, whatever that is. And that will give everybody a roadmap about what to do next and what, what principles really need to be invoked. I, I think we have time for one more. And there was a hand there in the corner, Patrick. So for those of us who are not super familiar with this incredibly nuanced issue, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm wondering, uh, but who care about the open internet, I'm wondering what kinds of uh, communications products or killer infographics or comic book version mm -hmm. you have to educate citizens about that and give them a pathway for action. Public Knowledge put out something good just yesterday, right, about what is, what is net neutrality. So look at publicknowledge.org. I wrote a book about this called Captive Audience, mm -hmm. which, which does put this in context and explains how this all fits and tries to do it in an approachable way. But frankly, that's been one of the problems, that there's a very steep learning curve here, a lot of acronyms, a lot of shiny objects, and people get confused. Yes. Yeah, we'll have more content, too. Stephen mentioned Magnet, which is a great resource at, at freepress.net and, and savetheinternet.com as well. We'll have lots of information as this kind of revives itself. I mean, people have sort of said, oh, that's that old issue, right? And it's really not yesterday's news in any sense. It's just as vital today as it was three years ago, 15 years ago you know, 40 or 50 years ago when the FCC started struggling with these issues. I, I think the appeal to common sense is really about the best we can do, though. You know, should your communications capabilities be changing just because today you can send an email? Is that really that different from a phone call? Or do you still want to have the ability and, frankly, the right to send your information to whomever you want? And, you know, so it, it's, it's a little bit hard to draw the Internet, even though we've tried. Um, but, you know, I think it's easy to, for people to understand that these are tools they need and need today as much as ever. And as Stephen said, you know, that people rely on these as basic necessities now. That, that is a horizon that moves over time, and we need more and more access to information just to keep up in this economy and just to keep up with our families. And, and I just want to say, hopefully very quickly, um, again, I want to emphasize uh, what I've said to the commissioners themselves and what I've said to um, other audiences. The FCC, the, the commissioners have to begin to say very loudly so that state utility commissioners, legislators, and everyday citizens can hear them say that there are mixed messages out there and that they exist for a purpose, the FCC does, and that they are not the stopgap that many in the industry are telling these policymakers and that people will be harmed. 
uh, because of this misinformation. And I think the commissioners need to be more vocal to more diverse audiences in letting them know what their role is and, and why they were created in the first place and the statutes that they operate under. So I'll offer up in terms of our national network, um, we host uh, monthly conversations called Digital Dialogues where we try to take a look at these issues, really deconstruct them, um, and also connect them to some of the broader social justice issues or some of the issues that people really care about on a day to day. Um, some of the members in our network have developed some interesting tools uh, to kind of help break down the issue. One thing that comes to mind in particular, People's Production House, which was an organization in New York, um, produced a video called Internet is Serious Business, which if you look it up on Vimeo, it's a great video that's produced by youth um, that really kind of explains how the internet functions, but also takes a look at this issue around network neutrality. Um, they also, in partnership with the Media Literacy Project, produced a dialed-in toolkit which took a look at how mobile functions, and mobile obviously being um, an issue in relation to net neutrality that's very relevant since a lot of folks, uh, the same protections don't exist uh, necessarily for folks who are uh, exclusively wireless users. Um, and then lastly, you know, when net neutrality was a big uh, hot button issue a couple years ago, our network produced uh, what we call the rap. It was a it was a remix of a Warren G a song called Regulate, um, which was specifically looking at trying to explain, you know, what this whole proceeding was about. So you should look that up. Oh, I, I was going to say, I think that we're hitting yeah. the, the firm stop yeah. now, and um, I, I noticed the room getting a little restless. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, we'll end it there, um, but we'll be around if anyone has um, any additional questions for us. Thank you.